The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of GodQuest Ministries. What made a former biology professor evolve into a creationist? From the CTN studio in Pensacola, Florida, this is The Creation Today Show. I'm one of your hosts, Eric Hoven, and I'm joined by Paul Taylor. And we've got a very special program for you today. We are interviewing Dr. Gary Parker. Oh. And I think it's fair to say, isn't it, Eric, that uh, Dr. Parker is really one of the grandfathers of the creation movement. I don't think he'd mind me saying he's old enough to be the grandfather of the creation <laughs> movement. I think at 70 some years old and still traveling around and speaking, he really does remind me of a grandpa when you sit down and talk to him. A very kindly grandpa and one who knows a great deal about the creation, evolution, and fossils and so on. Oh, a brilliant, brilliant man. You're gonna love this show. <laughs> As a former professor of evolutionary biology, Dr. Gary Parker certainly knows his stuff. And Paul Taylor and I had the chance just recently to go over to Mobile, Alabama for an Answers in Genesis conference and get a chance to sit down and talk with Dr. Parker. And boy, that was incredible. It was a great thrill. And it was just, a, it was just great fun to be able to sit down at the table and just chat about things. Uh, and yet, don't let his kindly demeanor fool you. He is an expert on yeah. fossils. He and his wife do a great deal on, uh, on fossils, digging them up. Up. And uh, we know that f the peninsula of Florida is, in fact, one of the best places in the world for finding fossils. And that's like his backyard. That's they right. actually take expeditions down to go to let people dig out their own fossils and even keep them. They found some amazing stuff. I, I can't wait for you guys to hear from Dr. Parker and from some of his knowledge. It's incredible. It's absolutely amazing. And of course, he's written books on the subject. And we were able to talk to him about the amazing fossils that are found in Arcadia and around that area. Enjoy this interview with Dr. Gary Parker. Well, Dr. Parker, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and uh, Paul and I for yes. Creation Today Show live here. You have been around the block when it comes to creation, haven't you? <laughs> yes. I, I don't mean to insinuate anything here. I'm just saying you've kind of been around. How long have you been involved in creation ministry? Uh, well, I've been involved in it, uh, well, I guess about 40 years. My but goodness. before that, I was involved on the other side. You know, preaching and teaching evolution, you know, and really trying to convince my students they had to give up silly old myths and fables like the Bible. And, and uh, boy, it was, uh, it was hard enough to, to get myself, uh, you know, into the creation movement. Mm -hmm. In fact, I couldn't do it. It took the Lord Jesus and a Bible mm -hmm. study and an excellent Bible teacher to really change my thinking. And since then, it's been such a thrill. Uh, you know, to be involved in university debates and, and talks and seminars and children's mm. programs and field trips. It's just awesome. Yeah. And in fact, you wrote a book, didn't you, Dr. Parker, about your, your testimony, really, of how you moved from that atheist evolutionist position to, uh, to faith. And yes, uh, yeah. uh, creation, uh, the facts of life. Uh, it kind of summarizes all the arguments I used to use with myself and to my students of, uh, for evolution and how the rest of the story, the part they don't tell you, points away from evolution and toward not just creation in general, but the whole gospel message. And uh, when you look at the world, you know, we see evidence of design, beauty, harmony that points to creation. And then we see what Darwin talked about, the war of nature, famine and death. Right. But it didn't make the production of higher animals. You know, it's a consequence of sin. That's what brought struggle and death into the world. It makes things worse, not better. Brought on the catastrophic judgment of Noah's flood. But praise God, uh, he delivers us from ourselves, from no our kidding. sin. So wow, from so atheist <laughs> or from evolutionist yeah. to creationist yeah. and a young earth creationism now for 40 years, what, was your, what were you teaching back in college? Oh, uh, I... Uh, do you remember? Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> do my students remember? That's the real question. But I averaged about 10 different courses at the college level a year. It really kept me sharp for this. So, uh, you know, I taught genetics and molecular biology, invertebrate zoology, botany, anatomy, physiology, all uh, pre-med physics. Uh, and you really made fun chemistry. of the students. <laughs> you really made fun of the students for and wanted them to get rid of this idea of God and religion. 
to start with. To start with, yeah, right, that's right. what I was doing. You know, the the you know how can how can you know how dumb can Christians be? Can't mm -hmm. you see that you know variety plus struggle? Uh, you know, some varieties survive more than others. Evolution's a fact. Okay, well, it's a fact that organisms move into new environments when times change, and that God designed them to multiply and fill the earth, and He gave them incredible variability right from the start. And so I used to look at my students and say, how come they can't accept the fact of evolution? And my students were looking at me, how come he can't realize <laughs> that you just see variations within kinds multiplying and filling. You don't see kinds changing into other things. You just see them changing location uh, to where the traits that God gave them you know, fits the environment in which they live. Wow. Now, we, we have a number of, of, of fossils here on the table, and we're not just mm -hmm. talking about me, but uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things in any educational institute uh, is, that, is that they claim that fossils are an evidence for evolution. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the Florida, the Florida um, Department of Education has a, a document for its high schools yeah. on that subject, saying mm -hmm. that the pupils need to be taught that uh, mm -hmm. fossils are evidence for evolution. So uh, if that's the case, what are you as a creationist doing with some yeah, fossils yeah. on you're the not, table you're not here? To have <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm here to tell the students Darwin was right about fossils, because Darwin said fossils were the most obvious and serious objection to evolutionary theory, the exact uh -huh. opposite wow. of what's being taught in schools. Yeah, this is one of my yeah, personal favorites. Cool right there. <laughs> tell, tell us what this is. It okay. looks like an eagle's claw, but it's not, <laughs> is it? It's, uh, it's this a, is it's from a mammal. really big eagle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, this is uh, the fingernail, as it were, of a giant ground sloth. And so we have a little museum in South Florida, a little town of Arcadia. Uh, on the banks of Peace River there, which is one of the best places on Earth to hunt fossils. My wife and I have collected fossils from five continents. There's no places better than right there at Peace River. Wow. Now this one was actually near there. This one was uh, discovered by a friend of ours, Frank Garcia, the original fossil. Uh, the giant ground sloth was bigger, heavier, and taller than T. rex. And uh, this is just the joint, you know, on his finger here. Uh, this is a claw core. Now, this is a replica. Now, a replica is an exact copy of a real fossil. You know, evolution, yes. they, they just make stuff up, you know. But now, this is a copy, same size, shape, the and, and, and the same color. This would have been covered by fingernail material, keratin, going out like that. And so this guy, wow, you know, stood taller than T-Rex. And uh, you think, well, this, you know, you got to rip the guts out of a uh, triceratops or anything if you, you could wanted catch to. Him, though, he's a yeah. Slug, right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. That'd probably help. Plus, this is a giant leaf rake. And so oh, yes. we use this, you know, to rake leaves out of the trees, to bend the branches down to get at the delicate young growth and so on. And, and so uh, he stayed the way God created all animals as just a vegetarian. Some animals, uh, after sin into the world, did begin to eat other animals, but the great big sloth just stuck to a vegetarian diet. Hmm. And you might wonder, how do I know that? Well, yeah, how do you Here's the that? answer, okay. You're kidding. That, yeah. That's <laughs> the stomach of a dinosaur, right? Well, no, this is uh, not... leftovers that were in the stomach. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, here's another one. This might look a little oh, like something a dog goodness. might have dropped in your yard. I'm going to say my dog produced something like that. <laughs> yeah. he, he wasn't very well at the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the technical name for these are coprolites. Now, the good news is, uh, you can hear that. See, they're, they're changed into stone. They're so, not mushy anymore. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> come off in your hand. You know, it's not mushy at all. Uh, and if you have a rock saw, my wife has a rock saw, uh, you can uh, slice a piece off of one of these things. This is a piece of dino poo here. And a so slice you, know, you slice it off, polish it, look at it under the microscope and see what the animal ate. If it was a vegetarian, there'll be bits and pieces of twigs and leaves. If it was a meat eater, there'll be bits and pieces of broken bone. This is yeah, fascinating. Yeah, the science it's wonderful. wonderful, okay? All right, well, I want to continue this because you've got lots more to talk about after 40 years. You've got quite a history there. We're going to take a quick break from talking with Dr. Parker. Uh, when, we, when we come back, I want to continue this conversation. We've got a lot more to learn. Creation Today is introducing a new audio resource, the Holy Bible on Double Speed. The first disc of this three-disc set presents Alexander Scorby's wonderful reading of the Bible at the original recorded speed. The second disc is digitally enhanced to one and a half times faster than the original speed. 
The third disc is literally double the speed of the original audio recordings. With this new resource, we invite you to fly through the Bible to gain an amazing new view of God's Word. Can Christians believe the Bible from the very first word? This new study, The Six Days of Genesis, by creation speaker Paul Taylor, will help Christians understand exactly what happened during the creation week and why it is foundationally important to believe it. You will enjoy every minute of Paul's unique presentation style, combining scientific facts, solid biblical teaching, and a little British humor. For more information, visit us at www.creationtoday.org. Welcome back to the Creation Today Show. We're at Dolphin Way Baptist Church in Mobile, Alabama, where Ken Ham and Gary Parker have been putting on a seminar. And Gary, mm -hmm. thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with us. Coming up in the next segment, I want to talk to you about these fossils, if it takes millions of years for these fossils to form. Paul, you and I get these kind of questions all the time, don't we? We do. There's hardly a, hardly a week goes by without me getting an email saying, oh, we found some dinosaur fossils and they've been carbon dated to be millions of years old, you know, and sort of email them back and say, no, they haven't. <laughs> it's a very simple answer. But um, before we get into that, let's, let's talk about your base in Arcadia in yeah. Florida. Uh, tell us a little bit about the things that you do there, because oh. you're really involved in sort of hands-on work on fossils though, aren't you? Uh, yes, uh, my wife and I, uh, oh, we're two little science nerds that met in <laughs> high school chemistry class over 50 years ago. And after I retired from full-time college teaching, we thought, boy, oh boy, we could have people come to us at a museum there in Arcadia. It's actually in our house uh, with city permission. Uh, and we specialize in small groups, oh, 15 to 25 is about average. Uh, and so it's intense activity with lots of personal attention and lots of time to ask questions. Uh, and uh, it's hands-on, so we, we give them a preview. And I'll tell the students that they're coming in that they're going home with bags full of missionaries. <laughs> that uh, every fossil you find is a missionary. Yes. Its design tells you about creation. Its death tells you about sin. Its rapid burial tells you about catastrophe. And the fact we're talking about it means God had a way of escape. Creation, corruption, catastrophe, Christ. And, and then we go into a hands-on workshop area. And we've hunted fossils on five continents. There is no better place than Arcadia, Florida to hunt fossils. Number one, you get to find bone. Bone is rare. Over 95% of all fossils are just seashells. Yep. But here you get to find bones, big bones. <laughs> that giant ground sloth we mentioned, bigger than T-Rex, mammoths and mastodons, a saber-toothed cat, a state fossil of Florida and California. Kidding. We got that. Uh, camels, llamas, giant bison, uh, bears, along with deer and rabbits and things like that. <laughs> Next and, vacation, and, <laughs> Arcadia. <laughs> oh my goodness. We actually have had a week-long creation adventure vacation, creation education vacations, you know, where whole families can come and, and uh, you get the hands-on activity and then out to the river, dig up your own fossils and take them with you. And we have permits, you know, to do that. Mary files a report with the state. Giant armadillos as big as an SUV. And uh, yeah, it's just incredible. What kid took that home? <laughs> Daddy, <please>. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, the good news is you usually wind up taking home bits and pieces of gotcha. these really large animals. But we did excavate, helped excavate, a family of mammoths. Oh my uh, and so uh, well, that's our missionary mammoth display. Wow. Uh, and uh, our dad and his 10 year old daughter. Uh, dug up right after a canoe trip that we did there. Sometimes we use canoes to get to remote locations. Here's a leg bone that's taller than this 10 year old girl and yet it still has a growth plate which tells us it's still growing. Mm. And so boy oh boy this is a baby mammoth. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then later on we find How mommy cool and daddy, you know, and, and, uh, and so we're, we're putting some of these together and it's just, and we keep finding more and more things like this. That's wonderful. Uh, and uh, at anything from all over the world. Now those were land animals. Right. But they're mixed with manatees or dugongs, sea cow fossils, whales, dolphins, walrus. A uh, young man that's working with us, we hope he takes over for us, uh, Will Zinke, uh, has found uh, a walrus tusk that big, uh, one of the five largest ever found in Florida. Somebody offered him a restored 57 Chevy for it. Now, I'd have the Chevy, not the walrus tusk. <laughs> Here, I'll find another one, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and pufferfish and uh, sturgeon. 
uh, and you saw tapirs, animals that live all over the world in different environments, land and sea, mixed together in one shovelful, oh. and then you get megalodon teeth, the great white shark. Right fossil as big as the palm of your hand. Now I found them up to that big, right. but uh, Will and others have found them that big. And the students will find hundreds of little ones, you know, an average fossil adventure. Now that's interesting, uh, isn't it? Because, you know, mm -hmm. presumably these fish must have climbed out of the sea and right. crawled up. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> but you, you were telling me in conversation, I don't mean that by the way, that's just a joke, <laughs> but you, you were telling me about something called the fossil hash, and this is what you mean, isn't yes. it? The fact uh -huh. there's so many animals uh -huh. uh, of different sorts. Mm -hmm. How did you get so many different sorts uh -huh. of animals in uh -huh. one place, do you think? Uh, and that fossil hash, that's a term used by state geologists. Oh, uh, it wasn't know, invented in, in the 60s, yeah. was it? <laughs> Hash? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, not, not, not this time. <laughs> Wasn't sure. <laughs> or other things. <laughs> uh, and you, you get joke. land okay. and sea creatures all mixed together, and creatures that today are distributed in many environments. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike the layers in Grand Canyon, that's another favorite location I have. How'd it get that way? Yeah. Well, it looks like that uh, a lot of the fossils in Florida uh, are actually storm deposits. Uh, you know, you hear about what's called the Ice Age. Well, we need to rename that. It's the ice and storm age that followed and was generated by Noah's flood. Mm. And so at the time of Noah's flood, wow, you get zillions of plants, animals, microbes, sorry about this, great, great grandma and grandpa, you know, buried <laughs> under heavy loads of sediment. And so as they decomposed, the carbon wasn't released to the atmosphere. It's like throwing off a, a blanket, you know, on a warm night. And so during the centuries that immediately followed the flood, they got colder, land cools quicker than oceans. Right. And so now you get piles of snow building up near the poles, but farther down in the mid-latitudes and tropical latitudes, now you get warm, moist air because the oceans are still warm. Okay, the continents are cold, warm, moist air, cold, dry air. When they meet, rain, thunderstorms, hurricanes, hypercanes. And so scientists have discovered evidence uh, that in the recent past, there, you know, a storm today, a hurricane might have an eye 50 miles wide with a hill of water 30 miles uh, or 30 feet high in the middle of it. Hypercanes would be, the eye would be 250 miles oh wide. A hill of water 100 miles. The eye wall winds, three, four, 500 tornado strength eye wall winds. And Goodbye, of course, Florida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so if you're, a, you know, a, a whale or a dolphin or a manatee or a shark or a shark or a shark, you don't get out there where the water's, you know, all turned around and get right in the middle. Calm, gentle breezes, lots of sunshine. But as that moves toward the Florida coast, it breaks into a big tsunami wave. Mm -hmm. The whole length of the state dumps these sea creatures right on top of some really startled mammoths, mastodons, giant ground sloths, giant armadillos, bison, you know, all these kind of things. Rolls them into shells that wash clear across the state. That's Florida. So if you didn't yeah. know any better, the, the, the Florida hash, right, is what it's called? Mm -hmm. yes. Florida hash would actually be an evidence for the worldwide flood and the biblical account of creation. That's exactly right. Yeah. But yes. you atheists know better, right? You guys know better than that. Somehow, you guys know better. It, it is fascinating that all these things are discovered together, mixed together. Yeah. Um, and it's, you can dig them up. And we like the hands-on, close contact with young people. We want yes. another generation of creation scientists. The evolutionists don't know what's going to hit them. Well, yeah. we're going to uh, be right back with Dr. Parker. Uh, enjoying this, this conversation because there's so yes. much fascinating information. We'll talk with him right after this break.
Welcome back. You're watching The Creation Today Show with me, Paul Taylor, and with Eric Hovind, and our very special guest, Dr. Gary Parker. Now, Gary, you were telling me before that uh, your wife had found a, a, one particular fossil that was quite interesting, and it was a fossil clam. And I guess yes, if, uh, if most of us had seen that, we'd have thought, this is just a seashell, fossil <laughs> seashell. But this was very special, this particular clam. Could you explain to us why this fossil is so special? Yes, and I have to admit, my opinion opinion was yours. A clam! How can I get excited about a fossil clam? <laughs> yeah, I wonder how far this will skip. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then my wife says, look closer. So I look closer and, you know, well, it's a really pretty clam. It's Elliot. No, no. Did you notice the flesh on the right. clam? Now we're hunting in a fossil shell deposit and this clam has flesh on it. So I'm thinking to myself, ah, this crawled in and died a couple of weeks ago. It yes. says, don't you know what clam that is? Uh-oh. She knows fossils a lot better than I do for ID. Milthia calusiensis. So I'm rolling my eyes around. This is an index uh, fossil to the Pliocene. Now for an evolutionist, an index fossil is a, is a fossil that lived at a certain time in the past. Yes. For a creationist, it lived at a certain place in the past. <laughs> right. okay. but can, for, we just, can we just yeah, emphasize this yeah. business about index fossils, though, please? Because yeah. you know, when, when people say, oh, the fossils have been dated by such, they haven't used carbon dates and radiometric yeah. dates, and they're using this index system, aren't they? Right. Uh -huh. And so they've arranged in their minds fossils in certain stages of evolution. Yes and then use that to, to date and then say that confirms evolution mm. which was used to what assume the dating <laughs> in the sequence to start with. And uh, so here they kind of so trap themselves. Because yeah. here's this clam, they think, the evolutionists say, that's two to five million years old, but it's got some meat on it. So I, we take it up to the State Museum. Now I really thought, I've gotten forgiveness for this, and Mary misidentified it. But she takes it in the back room and Sinus looks at it, you're right, this is Milthia calusiensis. It's an index to Pliocene fossils that ought to be two million years old, maybe five million years old. You're right, it's still got some of the flesh on it. You're right, these things are a real mystery. And he pulled out a drawer full of them. So where were they? In the wow. back room, yeah, not on public not display, not the only one. No wonder all the evolutionists <laughs> secrets. No wonder all the evolutionists keep saying, if we ever found a fossil not in the proper, uh, they store it in the back room, that's put right. it away in a box, and hope nobody ever finds it. And so that's what happened with this one. And so we have lots of evidence. And of course, you guys have had programs about the uh, the blood cells, yes. you know, found yes. inside stretchable blood vessels inside a T. Rex thought to be 68 million years old. The one thing we know for sure that's not true. That's definitely not true. Uh, and even the state museum here talks about these large animals. You know, Florida was just everything in the world was here. And they say the last of these large animals were hunted to extinction by my ancestors, the American mm -hmm. Indians, about four thousand years ago, almost exactly the same date we would give for it. So once Very in a while, the evolutionists get a correct date, but then it agrees with the Bible. That's so right. <laughs> That's right. Okay, now a lot of times we get questions about, okay, does it take millions of years for yeah. fossils to form? This is your expertise. This is what you guys do. Uh -huh. How long does this process really take? I mean, what's the truth about uh -huh. it? Oh, it can happen really, really fast. Mm. Uh, we have uh, a fossil, quote, teddy bear. Okay, it's uh, permineralized. And so most fossils are formed uh, when mineral fills in the empty spaces in the wood or shell or a bone. Uh, and in this particular case, here's this little teddy bear. It was formed in Naresboro, England, Mother Shipton's Cave, a little limestone uh, yes. ledge, dripping water. They hang this thing up. The water fills this little spongy thing. Water evaporates, leaves the limestone behind. Well, that was two, three months. In wow. the Czech Republic, they take paper roses, dip them in warm mineral water, and turn it into a permineralized, fossilized rose in two weeks. In Yellowstone Park, it's a matter of hours when something falls in, uh, you know, uh, 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 one of those hot springs. It absorbs mineral quickly. At Grand Canyon, the Havasu part of Grand Canyon, uh, these things are forming even today, rapidly, right before our very eyes. Not millions of years. All right. So, what about these? What about? How do you get fossilized? <laughs> Poo. <laughs> How does very, very carefully <laughs> it went to the bathroom in mineralized water? That's what's going on. 
actually, I like that. You like know, maybe yeah, that could be that, it. That yeah, could be that it. could be and, it. And there are, you know, backwater eddies, even in a flowing current, you know, where mud accumulates and things like that. And as soon, you know, precipitation is instant. As soon as you get material like that, it's got a lot of little air spaces in it and so on. It'll fossilize quickly, mm. but it is rare. The footprints wow. and things like yeah. that are rare, but uh, still part of the flood story. Well, we are getting toward the close of our time together, and I uh, thank you very much for taking time oh, with pleasure. us. I wanted yeah. to leave you with just a few minutes to just talk, you know, to the people. Mm -hmm. There might be somebody out there that's uh, got a lot of questions about this. What would yeah. you say to them? Well, of course, I had a lot of questions, a lot, a lot of questions, and praise God, I had people that could yeah. help me with those questions, and we're hoping to train a generation of people that can get the help with those questions that you really need from the Word of God, the one who was there, the one who not only saw what happened, but was in control of what happened. And wow, Jesus said, if you can't believe me when I tell you earthly things, how can you believe me when I tell you heavenly things? The good news is we can believe him when he tells us earthly things. And that encourages us to trust him for all those heavenly things. It's not millions of years of struggle and death till death wins, life wins, new life in Jesus Christ. You know, Paul and I left that interview going, we have only scratched the surface of his knowledge. I mean, this guy is so brilliant when it comes to the creation evolution debate, being a former evolutionist. We could have talked to him for hours and hours. And, you know, um, Gary has written some very important books. You know, uh, he's written textbooks for high school students. He's written books for, uh, for younger children. He can write really at any level. And there's a very interesting book, of course, that uh, so we mentioned briefly on the show, but didn't talk about the contents of it too much, which is called Creation Facts of Life. And the point about that book is he actually, it's a sort of semi-autobiographical. He talks about how evolution cannot be scientific but he does it through his own experience. <laughs> what he learned walking this path from evolutionary biologist to really grandfather of the creation movement along with some of the other greats like Henry Morris. That's right. And of course, when we were at the conference, we heard the, the talk that he gave, yeah. uh, which is basically a summary of that book. Talked about how he was a, a professor of evolutionary biology, he was teaching evolution, and he was even using that as a platform <laughs> to ridicule the Christians that were in his, uh, in his lectures. Just amazing. It really does happen if you're not in freshman biology yet, or if you never got a chance to take it, they really do make fun of the religious worldview of creationists, and they really don't have a good foundation to do so. Yes, but obviously Gary, having a, a more astute scientific mind, gradually began to realize through that that he was on the wrong track. He was, uh, yeah. he, he realized that what he was talking about was simply not scientific. Well, we hope you enjoyed the interview that we got to have with Dr. Gary Parker. Uh, it certainly was enjoyable for us to meet yes. him. And uh, if you have questions, you can feel free to send those into questions at Creation Today. This show is here for you. Thank you so much for watching. Do you need the tools to defend your faith? Visit our websites for up-to-date content. Attend one of our live events and shop online at creationstore.org. We are Creation Today.